I'm Barbara Bogave, in for Madeline Brand, and you're listening to Women's Rights After the Arab Spring on America Abroad. From women in Turkey, we turn now to Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, oil-rich countries with Bedouin roots. Historically, women's status in the area lagged behind that of North Africa and the Arab countries of the eastern Mediterranean. And while there's still a long way to go, Turkey al dahil says some progress has been made. He's a prominent Saudi media personality and booster of women's causes. For years, he's hosted a Larry King-like talk show on the pan-regional TV network Al Arabiya. We hear him now speaking in Arabic through an interpreter. Women have made considerable headway in Saudi Arabia toward achieving their rights. We're in need of much more, but taking stock of the recent past, it means a lot that the king appointed 30 women to serve in the Legislative Council, as well as a woman to serve as the Minister of Information and Education. Saudi Arabia has a long history of gender segregation in the workplace. Age-old traditions have restricted women's professional advancement. And for decades, the country's religious police have strictly enforced the wearing of the veil in public spaces. So the appointment of 30 women to the legislature and the rise in the prominence of women in the Saudi private sector represent major steps forward in the kingdom. And giving a woman control over the educational system is an especially bold step. For decades, it's been dominated by Islamist hardliners who opposed women's advancement. Turkey al dahil explains. There's a powerful political stream in Saudi Arabia that's not at all pleased with these improvements in women's rights, which they view as westernization. The reforms are opposed by extremists in Saudi Arabia, as well as other Arab and Islamic states. And, by the way, the extremists aren't all men. Some women are also trying to block the new opportunities in the offing for their own gender. But the education minister, Noura Al-Fais, has managed to do a lot in response. And today, 60% of university and high school students are girls. Dakhil has parlayed his media notoriety to create a think tank in Dubai called the Al Masbar Center for Studies and Research, as well as a publishing house whose content helps advance civil society in the Arab world. Last year, Al Masbar asked 10 female scholars from Beirut to Benghazi to put together a book on Arab women after the Arab Spring. Their research traces a disturbing divide when it comes to the shifting status of women across the region. Turkey al dahil While women in the Gulf states are making progress in winning their rights, from education to public life, in the countries that went through revolutions since 2011, like Tunis, for example, where women had achieved a very high position in society, we find the status of women to be regressing. The Islamist groups that have come to power oppose the cause of women, and we see things moving backwards for women, whether in Tunisia or Egypt or even in Yemen. Turkey al dahil takes this problem personally. He's the father of three children, two sons, and one daughter named May, now studying in Canada. Hello, my name is uh, May al and my dad is uh, Turkey al dahil and I'm currently in grade 9. My family, and uh, this is all because of my father, we're open-minded, even though we're Saudi, and we still do the same things that other Saudi people do which is to practice our religion, our prayers, and so on. We do the same thing, but it's just in an open mind. My father have raised me to be obviously respectful and so on, like any parent would do that. But he also raised me to not consider that just because I'm Saudi and people have that image of a Saudi woman that I can't express my feelings or my talents and so on. And honestly, when you have someone by your side, it's better. And it gets easier. And I think that person who's on my side is my dad, but both my parents. (laughs) May's father is painfully aware that when she comes home to Saudi Arabia, she still won't enjoy the same rights as her brothers. I want my daughter not just to get the same opportunities as her older and younger brothers, but rather to achieve even greater rights, because women are subject to oppression in many places, and they need an opportunity to fight that oppression. As we learned from Turkey al dahil there's been some notable progress in the works for women in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the Gulf. While countries such as Tunisia and Egypt had taken big social, political, and constitutional strides on women's issues, the turmoil of the revolutions has now jeopardized the physical security and safety that women used to enjoy. 
Is there something to be said for the incremental changes in women's rights in the Gulf kingdoms, in contrast with the tumult of the revolutions in so many parts of the Middle East? America Abroad's Joseph Browdy explores this question, starting out not far from Saudi Arabia, in the Emirate of Kuwait. Like Saudi Arabia, Kuwait has traditionally rejected the principles of gender equality. But the situation in Kuwait has been changing, gradually, as Joseph Browdy reports. This is the sound of one Kuwaiti woman after another swearing in as members of Kuwait's elected parliament after a landmark decision in 2005 granting women the right to vote and run for office. It happened seven years before the Arab Spring revolutions of 2011. It was a big campaign, government and NGOs together, and the vote passed through the parliament. That's Nada al Mutawa, a political scientist and activist for women who heads the Department of Strategic Studies at Kuwait University. She says the campaign for women's suffrage had been going on for decades, and what finally made it happen was a push from the country's ruler, known in Kuwait as the Emir. Women since the early 60s have been trying to get their votes. They had a major ally in 2005, a personality who believed in these rights. The current emir, Sheikh Sabah Ahmed, he believed in it. As a person, he's influential on voters in Kuwait, on the conservative families in Kuwait. And the vote passed through the parliament. And that was the year where women became part of the, the only elected parliament in the area. During the Arab revolutions of 2011 and 12, every government that collapsed was a so-called military republic, while all of the region's eight dynastic states, the kingdoms of Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and Morocco, and the five Gulf sheikhdoms, weathered the storm intact. Arab dynasties, grounded in the history and folklore of their societies, tend to enjoy greater legitimacy with their populations. And in recent years, they've also seen increased social and political reforms. There is a common thread that's often discussed now that Muslim countries which had kings in the Middle East have done better off than those who didn't. Well, for the moment, they are. Leila Ahmed is a Harvard Divinity School professor and author of A Quiet Revolution, The Veil's Resurgence from the Middle East to America. They're stable countries, for one thing, and hopes for women are better there, and better in terms of moving forward. There's things that uh, still exist in Egypt and Tunisia and elsewhere that uh, Saudi women don't have the right to do, you know. We still can't drive. Egypt and Tunisia have been driving since the early 20th century. Though kings and emirs don't run for re-election, they do face pressure from their populations. And over the past decade, through satellite television and the internet, women in the monarchies have seen greater freedoms elsewhere and more aggressively demanded them back home, a more subtle, slow-paced form of Arab Spring. Kuwait's Nada al Mutawa. You know, when I think about uh, the changes that we went through since 2005, I think we did have a, a mini um, sort of a spring or a lot of changes that went on uh, women and parliament and laws and uh, the freedom of speech and the freedom to protest. We got a lot of changes uh, since then. Meanwhile, the revolutions of Egypt and Tunisia saw skyrocketing violence against women. But even those countries remain better off than civil war-torn Syria or Libya, where massive civil strife may well grow into civil war. Leila Ahmed. Women, of course, are subject to rape, and when men are killed, women and children suffer in, in any war. Both sexes suffer, but I, it seems that uh, women are, are certainly more vulnerable, the children are more vulnerable, and if, if a man is killed, the family loses his income, so the costs for women are huge in, in wars. Revolutions often start out with the promise of greater liberty for women. But after high hopes fade, instability and insecurity take their toll. The Arab Spring may yet bring women forward, but for now at least there's a feeling that the kind of gradual reform one finds in Arab dynasties is preferable. For America Abroad, I'm Joseph Browdy.
Milan Revere is the executive director of the Institute for Women, Peace, and Security at Georgetown University. She's the former U.S. ambassador at large for global women's issues from 2009 to 2013. She worked closely with former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton to advance the political, social, and economic status of women and girls around the world. I asked her how she and Secretary of State Clinton viewed the role of secularism and Islam in women's lives. Many of them have said to me over the course of years, not just since the Arab awakening, uh, that they consider themselves good Muslims, and yet they resent deeply and pay a price for those who, in the name of religion, hijack their religion. And I remember vividly, and working with Secretary Clinton before she was secretary in Morocco, where the women struggled for years to pass family law reform, which is one of the really tough issues that comes to bear in this space. And as they were paying a price and dealing with the kinds of obstacles that they had to confront with in the name of those who opposed what they were doing in the name of religion, they said to themselves, but we're practitioners. This is our religion, and the way you're defining it is not our religion. And over time, family law reform was passed, the Mudwana reform uh, in Morocco. And when it was adopted, His Majesty, working with the women in the promulgation of this new law, stated the constitutive elements, whether it's women having custody of their children or the right to divorce or whatever it was. And in each instance, provided a verse from the Quran to support that, to make the case that this was consistent with what I have heard over and over since the Arab awakening is their difficulty in trying to achieve the progress that they want to achieve, given that some people with influence are trying to make the case against women in the name of religion. And for women, this is very difficult. Well, given that, of the work that you did as ambassador at large, what's borne the most fruit? What has borne the most fruit is in the area of enabling the women to have access to the kinds of resources, opportunities, capacity building opportunities, effectiveness training, the things that will serve them well in these circumstances to be able to prevail, hopefully. It's learning the best way to make arguments in the political sphere. Oftentimes, women are nowhere on the agenda of the international community, whether it's in terms of their economic well-being, and we know that no country is going to be able to economically prosper, to create jobs, to have the kind of growth at once, unless women are participating in small and medium-sized businesses and other ways economically. We know politically that if women are not at the table being able to present their case, uh, being protected from the violence, it's not likely to come out in a way that we would all like to see, whether it's what's going on now in terms of Syrian women participants and the Geneva II transition talks that hopefully will be realized, or whether it's the kind of ongoing processes in which the international community is engaged. How grassroots do you think that kind of support should go? Does that mean that These kinds of soft diplomacy solutions that you're talking about should go as practical as helping to increase Internet access. I think there has to be heat at the top, and there's nothing soft about that. These are issues that have to be raised in every bilateral discussion, in every international meeting, as issues that we, whatever country we're representing that is uh, trying to provide mediation in this process, Uh, considers important because it's not just important for the women. It's not just the right thing to do. This is the smart and effective thing to do if we want to see the kind of peace, prosperity, and stability that is important in those countries and more broadly. But you also need heat at the bottom, and that is working with the grassroots, whether it's supporting uh, NGOs who are in this work. You know, we know that oftentimes laws are passed, guarantees are placed in constitutions, And yet the reality on the ground is anything but, because they're not enforced and implemented. And so on the ground, there has to be also that ability to forge the kind of relations with others in the broader community. 
What lessons did you learn that, that I imagine you're applying now in your global women's initiatives? One of the most important ways in which to make effective arguments, certainly at the higher levels, is based on data. For example, the Arab Development Report that came out uh, several years ago showed that those countries that are at the bottom, many are at the bottom because women are not participating either politically or economically. The World Economic Forum's gender gap report shows that in those places where gender equality is closer to becoming a reality, uh, whether in political participation, economic participation, education and health, those countries are far more prosperous uh, and economically competitive. Also, we have to understand the limits of our own abilities. The United States has tremendous influence, to be sure. Uh, but if it's the United States that becomes the argument in our getting the support, it won't work. So oftentimes, other vehicles with which to provide that support through an international mechanism, for example, often makes it easier on the women in those circumstances. Milan Verveer. She served as the U.S. Ambassador at Large for Global Women's Issues from 2009 to 2013 and is now the Executive Director of the Institute for Women, Peace, and Security at Georgetown University. This hour was written and edited by Martha Little and produced by Rob Sachs and Jacob Conrad, with additional production help from Flawn Williams. You can hear past programs by subscribing to our podcast on iTunes. Find us on the TuneIn or Public Radio International apps, or by visiting our website, americaabroad.org. I'm Barbara Bogavin from Madeline Brand, and this is America Abroad from Public Radio International. Support for this show was provided by Public Radio International stations and listeners like you. Support was also provided by the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art and the Luce Foundation. PRI, Public Radio International.